Okay, let's get started with the webinar. Um, so yeah, it's the number of participants, it's still increasing. Um, we have 140 at the moment. So let's get started with it. Um, so welcome all again to this webinar. Um, as you all know, this is organized as part of outreach activities of COVID project, which is funded by European Union's um, Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. So the goal of this project is to um, create a comprehensive map of functionally active genomic features in cattle, and more importantly, to study the association between variation in them and uh, variation in important traits, both dairy and beef. Um, the ultimate aim is, of course, to integrate this biological knowledge into genomic selection schemes. Um, this, however, is of course, we foresee a lot of challenges. And today we hope to discuss some of the challenges and possible solutions um, in identifying and large scale genotyping such trait associated variants. So uh, today's scientific program is in two parts. In the first part, we will have four presentations, um, each 30 minutes. And at the end of each talk, we'll have 10 minutes for discussion. And in the second part, we have a panel discussion on the same topic, which will be moderated by Rupert Posh. So the, um, the presentations are as follows. Uh, the first one is from Duidon Xiang. He is a researcher at University of Melbourne, Australia, and he will talk about identifying genome-wide regulatory variants and using them in genomic prediction of cattle traits. The second talk is from Marie Pierre Sanchez from INRE. Uh, she will talk about use of custom chips to validate causal variants in cattle. The third talk is about low pass sequencing with GeneCov. Um, the talk is given by Jesse Hoff, who is a agri-economics agri product manager at GeneCov. And the topic is routine implementation of sequencing and genomic evaluations using low pass imputation and hybrid capture. And the last talk is from Anik Bowman, a researcher at Wageningen University. She will talk about opportunities using structural variation in animal improvement programs. A few organizational issues. Um, as you are all aware, probably that this webinar will be recorded and will be available on EAP's official YouTube channel and on their website. Uh, so as I um, mentioned earlier, we have 10 minutes dedicated after each talk for question and answer. I encourage participants to actively uh, type in your questions into the chat box. So the mics are probably muted, but you can interact um, by typing in your questions into a queue and a box, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. When you do that, please also leave your names and affiliation. Uh, we'll try to take as many questions as possible at the end of each talk. Uh, I would also like to remind you of the upcoming webinar in EAP's webinar series. The next webinar is on 12th of April and it's on feeding the green deal, specialty feed ingredients, contribution to environment and sustainability. So for more news and updates, you can um, follow EAP's website and connect to their social media account. Um, so with that, um, I would like to get started with um, today's uh, scientific program. Uh, the first talk is from Rudong Xiong. Uh, he's joining us from Melbourne. So thanks very much, Rudong, uh, for joining us, even though uh, it's not the most convenient time for you. Uh, probably it's midnight there. So thanks very much, and uh, you may start with your presentation. Thanks very much. Uh, let me share the screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Um, okay. Yep. I'll just. Uh... Right. Um, okay. Um, thanks, Naveen, to for the invitation, and uh, it's great to have a. Uh, a discussion with you uh, here at Australia, but uh, to Europe. So my talk is about identifying genome-wide um, 
regulatory variants and the use of them in genomic prediction for cattle traits. So um, genomic prediction is a, a great technology. It has been revolutionized the, the breeding industry. So going back to this very old slide, many of you have seen this many times. In a um, reference population, we could try a statistical model um, using available genotypes and phenotypes and reuse the predictive equation on these animals without phenotypes, but with genotypes. So we get the estimated phenotype or genetic merit called breeding value or EBV, and we use that to rank animals. And this approach uh, gives us increased accuracy of uh, breeding decisions, shortens the generation interval, and that is why it's been widely adopted by the breeding industry. However, um, one of the most important step in this business is actually the, the use of the genotypes, both in a reference and the uh, validation population. Now we do have to genotype animals to get this thing going. Uh, several, there are many tools actually here to do this business. One is the conventional microarray genotyping. You could get the 50K panel, uh, which is much somewhat well used in a routine EBV evaluation um, in a system. Uh, the other good alternative is the uh, genotype by sequencing. So that gives you uh, the uh, flexibility to increase market density, but uh, with in a reasonable budget. Another uh, emerging technology, which is quite interesting is the low pass genome sequencing. And if you use it well with the uh, imputation, it increased the power of detecting uh, both common rare variants. But regardless of which type of sequencing or genotype you choose, um, this, this, a couple of considerations are usually here. So when you do the routine genomic evaluation, we're talking about you know, hundreds of thousands of individuals, uh, the uh, system still prefers a small set of markers. And also in the scientific research, um, we still use the animal genotype data imputed from uh, small panels. And we do this to large cohorts to, to create a powerful data set. So um, instead of genotyping using you know, standard or randomly selected markers, we could actually consider genotyping directly using informative markers. And then we do an imputation from there and that probably will reduce the imputation error and gives us a better pre genomic prediction accuracy. And that is what we're trying to propose that these are the direct genotyping using informative markers. And that raises a first question. And why do we even want to do this uh, genotyping? Because, you know, when gen genomic prediction was invented, it was supposed to use all available markers um, so it doesn't really care about what sort of markers you use. But in fact, you should care a little bit because um, you, when you use the markers in the, instead of causal variants, the business is working because of the linkage distributor in between them. So when this LD um, gets decreased, for example, when you uh, doing genomic selection across or between generations or populations, that LD decreases and that erodes your prediction accuracy. And so this creates this uh, infamous conundrum and inaccurate out of sample prediction. And so when you train your model in a Chelstein and put into Jersey, you get low accuracy. And we hope that by using causal or putatively causal variants in genotyping that give, which might have consistent effects in different populations, that gives us power uh, to um, increase the accuracy of at least this sort of out, so out of sample genomic prediction. Now, um, it's difficult to find informative or causal markers, it's well known. So um, and we do try to utilize the multi-omics data set uh, to find informative markers. So I, I like to use this analogy, uh, which I believe many people have used this before. So uh, if we imagine that a cause of mutation is like a water droplet, it goes into the water and we obviously won't be able to find the exact location where it's dropped, but it will leave several uh, uh, waves on the surface of the water. 
for example, if we think that's a causal mutation, it would uh, leave a footprint and a transcriptome changes the expression of genes, of some genes. And uh, next, it could uh, affect some uh, metabolites profiles in a system and eventually gets onto the phenotypes. So we won't be able to find the exact location of the causal mutation, but based on its footprints and multi-omics data set, we could reverse engineer uh, the approximate location and of the causal mutation. So that gives at least some of the information about uh, how the informative markers uh, can be found. So based on that um, concept, um, we are interested in several sets of uh, functional information. So one type is, the, uh, is these mutations that with functional importance, which for example, they change the gene expression levels. We call them expression quantitative trait loci. It could also well change uh, the metabolic profiles uh, of animals, which we call them the metabolic quantitative trait loci. The other types of the mutations that are interesting is those ones with evolutionary significance. So they could be sites and mutations took place at sites conserved across species. And also within species, the cattle, for example, we could look for sites under selection between subspecies or between breeds. Another set of mutations that we think are important are the uh, ones that affect multiple traits. So in other words, pleiotropy. So we believe that mutations affecting more than one trait, they are more likely to be causal. So um, these are the, the different types of information we believe that are useful to find them. So we aim to um, identify regulatory variants that affect many traits in cattle. And once we find them, we would like to refine them to customize SIP chip. And so that can be routinely used in the industry for breeding. And we also would like to evaluate the application of such customized chip uh, in the genotyping or in a genomic prediction. And so the following slides will be kind of based around on these three points uh, in the stock. Um, well, first is to find these informative variants. Well, um, in our belief, we would like to use this functional genomics data as biological priors. Um, so what models would take priors the best? We believe it's Bayesian models, which are very flexible in terms of taking the priors. And to, to, to simplify this concept is that when we have the observational data set, that's the relationships between genotypes and phenotypes. As a, as a distribution, we could fit in a biological prior as another distribution that would uh, adjust our uh, posterior estimates or prediction, which makes uh, more accurate to map and predict. So based on this, we, we will have to have a set of priors and, and because uh, they are heavily relying on the uh, good priors to do a good Bayesian modeling. Now, um, in our, one of our previous work, we have developed this functional and evolutional trait heritability score, which we call faith score. Um, so this is based on a wide selection back then, uh, a functional genomics data set, and we evaluate how are they important for uh, many cattle traits. And we derive that a score to rank variant and variants that entered the analysis. So we ranked about 70 million SNPs. So um, here are some examples of the uh, potentially causal SNP in causal loci in the cattle, and they all ranked high in the uh, faith ranking. So we hope that we could use them as good biological prior for uh, uh, mapping and prediction. We will discuss that uh, a little bit more in the following slides. Um, now we got the priors, we got to um, do some uh, mapping. So in, in theory, we should uh, fit everything, you know, hundreds of thousands of animals and millions of sequences in our Bayesian model, but in practice, at least at the moment, we don't have the computational power so we rather do a stepwise approach where we reduce the number of markers uh, based on the functional and the pleiotropic 
information, which is based on the, the multi-traduous information. Um, so we prioritize top variants uh, in different genomic clusters, so basically uh, chunk the genome into different segments and the prioritize top variants within each segment. And then we come up with a set of remaining variants. So we fit those ones in base R model. And here we chose the model called base RC. It's a published work. So the C means the functional classes of variants as, as the, uh, the biological prior. So then we can fit our faith score or as in categorize the variants as high, medium, and low. And so three class as the biological priors will fit in the model. Um, so the traits we analyze are based on up to, uh, so uh, we have about data on 12,000 bulls and 33,000 cows. The traits we analyzed include uh, production traits, uh, management traits, fertility, survival, and a wide range of uh, 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 type traits, which are subject, subjective scoring of the, the cattle uh, body conformation based on productivity. Um, in terms of breeds, we've got a hosting Jersey, only a small amount of uh, uh, cross breeds and Australian red. So we have about 10,000 bulls and uh, many cows. So that's the approximate uh, data structure. Um, now, uh, the genotypes used back then, we used the standard uh, 1,000 bull genome pipeline to impute. Um, after several cutoffs, we kept about 70 million sequence variants uh, to be used in analysis. So um, first I want to look at this, uh, the GWAS results. And so this, this is the, the uh, meta-analysis of uh, GWAS using these impute sequence variants on our animals separately in bulls and cows. Here you could see that um, although we found, so there are many significant hits um, um, and the significant hits are from almost the similar regions, but the individual exact snips between sexes is somewhat different. So that kind of creates this sort of a different uh, GWAS results for further utilization. Um, so um, as I mentioned before, we will do GWAS preselection and the clustering analysis first uh, to de derive a set of variants to, to train the Bayesian models. That's what we call the cross-sex base R. So the detailed methods are in this paper published last year. Um, but basically we found about um, 165,000 variants in the bulls and cows. And then that's where we do this cross-sex uh, mapping. So we get the variants prioritized in the bulls and get them trained in the cows in base RC, fitting the faith score high, medium, low as biological priors. And conversely, we fit the variants prioritized in the cows and get them to train in the bulls. The reason of this complexity is that we don't want to select variants and train them in the same population, which creates bias. Um, so once we achieve that, we calculate the EBV uh, on, diff, on 50 KB segments, and that gives us the chance to calculate the variance of EBV across individuals. And when we merge the EBVs between sexes, we back transform the variance to the variance. And that gives us the variant ranking values uh, in different segments. So then we pick the top ones in each segment. And that gives us about 80,000 variants, which we will be use, using that as a pool to select variants, that, which we will be designing an Infinium XT bit chip. And eventually it gives us 50K array. So that basically describes this workflow of, of mapping and prioritizing informative variants. Um, so these sort of um, 80K prioritized variants, we in the end looked at their um, GWAS p-values before and after. So this is before prioritization, the GWAS p-values on a meta-analysis of 34 traits. So um, that's 70 million sequence variants. And, and the one on the right-hand side are the um, 80,000 prioritized variants. 
and G was P value on 34 trades. Now you could see that the two graphs didn't look very different, um, but uh, in fact, they are very different. So after uh, more than 200 folds of market reduction, uh, we somewhat managed to keep these uh, top hits uh, um, here, but uh, mostly we just thinned the bottom dots, the ones that are less informative. That's where uh, most of the chunks got uh, eliminated. So that looks okay. Um, and next, next we looked at the design of the chip. So we call this customized chip as XT50K. So it has a gap uh, of about 57.1K, which is comparable to the gap uh, on the uh, standard 50K. So that looks all right too. And then we go through this uh, design iteration, which is not that straightforward. So we have a pool of markers and then we separate them into indels and snips. And this is one hurdle is where you have to fit Illumina design score to make sure that they pass the design score. Otherwise they're gonna, they're gonna work on the, the chip. And then the second hurdle is this Infinium one markers, I believe that that is the uh, type of markers that took, will take two slots on a panel. So, and that, which means that if you have too many of this type of markers on your customized chip, you, you won't be able to have fit many of the SNPs you want to customize in the first place. So you have to reduce the amount of this two slot markers. So then we'll have to go through an iteration and we'll go back to our original pool, find the, their LD mates. And then we go through this again, several iterations that get us down to a, a good amount that we believe we have included enough informative markers. And that's uh, obviously we added a little bit uh, stuff from our home design. And that gives us the, uh, uh, the 50K array marker a customized chip. Um, so the composition of this panel uh, is like this. So we've gotten about 55,000 SIPs, a bit of indels, and about 13,000 regulatory variants, including various types of uh, expression QTL, and also a couple of thousand evolutionary variants. They are like conserved cross species or selection signature, and they're relatively young. And the majority of the variants on this panel have some kind of effects on the, those 34 traits. And we also managed to keep some about 3000 low math SNPs. Um, so that's the, comp that's the uh, makeup of this panel. Um, then obviously we got to evaluate how uh, it does the prediction uh, in, this is more like an academic setting. So we trained the marker, uh, panel markers on a 28,000 Australian cows, and then we let them predict traits in the New Zealand cows um, in a base R model. And this graph shows that uh, results of genomic prediction accuracy and y-axis is the accuracy, which is the correlation between the EBV and um, the uh, phenotype. Obviously this is cross country prediction and this is cow data set. So the overall, the um, the, the, the uh, accuracy is not super high, but as a comparison, you could see that um, when we use the uh, customized chip, which is the yellow bar to predict it has the highest prediction. When you look at the gray bar, which is the accuracy from the standard chip, it's always lower than the uh, uh, customized chip. And we also have a combined set, uh, which is the markers from two panels combined together. And that actually never outperforms uh, when you only use the customized chip alone. So that actually uh, supports the merit of the customized chip. Another way we looked at this uh, customized SNP chip is the enrichment of the variants that affects uh, 36 US traits. Um, so we never used any US data to try and identify these SNPs. So we, now we use them to look at whether we have identified some of the variants that could affect US traits. And in fact, we did see that, uh, you know, uh, at various p-value cutoffs, you know, to what extent they affect US traits, they, there is always more uh, enrichment in a, a customized chip than a standard chip that the markers, the SNP chip, the SNPs affecting the US 
uh, dairy traits. So that also supports the merit of this panel. Now we've done um, quite a lot of evaluation with the uh, 50K panel. What about the um, high density SNP chip, which contains about 600,000 SNPs that well tag, tag many uh, functional variants. So we, we conduct another evaluation here. Um, we use, we add different sets of uh, functional variants to the high density SNP chip. So this is chipsec, so variants on the chipsec peaks added to uh, uh, high density SNPs and coding variants added to it and so on until the last one. And they are finally mapped ADK added to high density SNP chips. So the metric we looked at is the mapping accuracy, which is the amount of genome the model needed to explain half of the genetic variants. So you would expect that the lower bar, the better result is because they need fewer genome to explain half of the heritability. And uh, the, uh, when you add the finely mapped ADK to the high density SNP chip, it, it, it needs fewer amount of genome to explain half of the genetic variants in comparison to use the um, high density SNP chip SNPs alone. And so that supports, again, and you can add even more gain values when you uh, compare it with the high density SNP chip. Um, we also did a uh, test on the genomic prediction accuracy in the same setting. So we added different regulatory variants to the high density SNP chips. And, and we tested this on various traits and breeds. We see that, um, you know, adding regulatory variants in most of the cases add values, again, more prediction accuracy, but we see a less increase in accuracy when we do this business to Holstein. Um, we see a bit more increase in the Jersey and the largest gain was seen is when we do this uh, prediction in Australian red. So we in fact see more improvements uh, by adding functional regulatory variants to high density step chip in small breeds. In theory, probably we attribute this to the fact that um, these functional variants could compensate some of the uh, um, small representation of these breeds in a training population when we do the modeling. So that, that is what we are hypothesizing now. Um, and we do want to evaluate the uh, routine, uh, how this works when we uh, uh, implement this in the industry. So, um, well, the industry likes small sets because they evaluate many animals and um, they have like a standard uh, pipelines. They don't want to change a lot too much. So we got to work with the industry uh, folks to further refine customized chip for, for them to use it. So we internally we have updated that um, the uh, customized chip a couple of times to um, make the needs met by them. And we also, so we combine our regulatory variants with this sort of industry preferred markers. This is somewhat a hybrid uh, chip for the industry to use. And then we also use the customized chip to genotype and impute experiment uh, animals. Now it's cumulative to 15,000 animals. So that gives us some new data to look at. Now what we did evaluate um, by using uh, industry data, how is the uh, genomic prediction accuracy compare between a customized or refined customized SNP chip and the uh, standard 50K again. So here I'm showing you the results of that. Um, so uh, the y-axis is the uh, increase in the accuracy. So it's the difference between the, the refined, the customized step, step chip and the uh, standard 50K. We see increase uh, again by looking at new industry data that uh, this uh, customized step chip on Jersey and Holstein, but also when we looked at different crossbreeds. So this is Jersey and Holstein, different crosses we will also see a benefits in, in, in increase in genomic prediction accuracy. So that's uh, also a good news. And again, supporting that um, this customized SNP chip, it does work. So um, that leads to my conclusions. Um, we've, 
we think that the, the regulatory variants that affect cattle traits it can be systematically identified. And when we find them, and we can use them to customize SNP chip, and they can be used to improve genomic prediction. Um, so we've done various tests on this customized chip, and we always find that it is working, and it actually works both in academic setting and in the breeding in the industry, as, at least in Australian setting. Um, and we're still improving on it. In fact, we are hoping to improve it to, in, to increase more accuracy in the next version of it. Um, and at, at the moment, we are exploring the use of these, uh, the regulatory or informative variants with the low pass sequencing, because this new technology, it gives us more flexibility if we want to uh, customize uh, the panels. And obviously we are going to map even more regulatory variants um, because there are a lot of activities going on at uh, the functional gen genomic sites and these updated FANG and new consortiums of forming with BovRec and farm GTEx and so on. So a lot more exciting and, and regulatory variants to come. And um, the traits we want to improve uh, this time, uh, we hopefully they can improve not just the production traits, and we are also interested in traits like welfare, fertility, and disease resistance. And uh, again, that the breeds other than host and Jersey, uh, we also want to improve a bit more. So hopefully we can contribute that uh, inclusion in uh, in animal genomics. So. Um, that, that's all of my talk. I'd like to uh, thank all the folks and the Southern Blue Genome and the Fund Consortium and all the teams and uh, mentors and uh, many funders. And, and that's it. And uh, happy to go into the discussion. Thanks, Rudon, for a nice presentation. Um, so there are no questions in the q and a box. Uh, please, if you have questions, please type in the q and a box. Uh, meanwhile, I, there is a question from Hubert Posh, and he, is, um, he has a question on slide number 16, uh, where you show the two Manhattan plots. And he is wondering why do you have reduced p-values in uh, when you do GWAS with uh, uh, the reduced density? So does it mean that your reduced density does not have the true causal variant? Um, well, we we never done a, a um, we've never done a wet experiment to um, to find out whether our uh, panel contains causal variants or not. So I cannot provide a definite answer on that, but. Um, it does improve uh, the prediction accuracy. So um, that is um, why um, it might have some, and at least some ones with the L, with the good LD um, with the causal variance. And another thing that we're running, the whole business is that G was, doesn't tell you the causal variance. So, a marker that has a low p-value on this plot does not mean it's a causal variant and it does not give you higher prediction accuracy. And we've tested this scenario and that is why we use the functional gen genomics data independent of GWAS results to tag to include causal variants and that is proven working. Thanks. Uh, we have another question from Adela. Um, she's asking, what was the overlap between the customized and the standard 50k chip? So that's about the size of the overlapping. So a few thousands. Yeah. And that's why when we work with the industry folks, we have to take on some more um, variants they prefer to use because they use many uh, markers that 
uh, existing on, on other standard panels. Okay. So there are a few questions popping up in the queue and the box now. So there's one from Tim Lutzen from Aquagen. He's asking, do you consider low pass sequencing with imputation to be cost effective compared to updating the custom genotyping chip? We are thinking that way, um, but um, we don't, we haven't completed the testing experiment. So um, we, we are still testing this. So, and I think at least in the near future, this will be more, uh, cost effective. So this is something we are currently very interesting in exploring at the moment. So that. So there's another question from Obasan El Hosin. Why the accuracy in crossbreed lower? Okay. Um, so there are several issues with that. Now, um, this, uh, I think I can create a great debate on this, but in my limited knowledge, um, the, the conventional genomic prediction is based on the steep markers. They are not causal. So um, that sort of thing works because uh, animal population has small effective population, and that is create, causing high LD between the markers and the cause of variance. And that um, is not going to be easily broken up um, by looking at the SNP chip within the breed. But if you look at the uh, prediction across the breed, so if you train your models in hosting and it predict in Jersey, and that LD between the SNP chip marker and the cause of variance are going to break down. And that will cause uh, that um, prediction not accurate. So the training model training L uh, on the uh, non cause of variance in hosting, for example, will not do a good job predicting um, the uh, phenotypes using the SNP chip markers in Jersey because the LD between them is low. And that is also affected by the fact that uh, the math, the minor allele frequency, and um, potentially some of the SNPs that are specific to the different breeds, um, these two factors can also contribute to that. Um, but um, these are out of the scope of what we're trying to do, because um, in order to beat these two issues, you will have to increase the number of uh, uh, populations in the training for different breeds. But we are hoping that by using functional genomics data set, we can find some causal variants that might have consistent effects in different populations. And that could work to some extent to, um, to offset that issue. Yeah, maybe there's time for one last question. Uh, Sun Wong Jang asks, uh, says, thanks for the nice presentation and results. Validation with an industry data, the accuracy gain still looks limited up to 9%. Do you expect to see similar results for the species that have smaller effective population size like pigs and chickens? Um, I don't have a great answer on that. Um, so there is also, or well, I've never tried other species. So different species would have different situation. Um, but um, in fact, um, I, what I have to explain is that um, the genetic improvement is um, slow, but accumulative, but it's permanent. So one or 2% of increase in a genomic prediction could generate quite a lot of value. I don't have the formula in my hand, but as even just a few percent of prediction accuracy, it increase that uh, selection rate and genetic gain is constant. It never goes back and it accumulates a lot over, over time. So it looks small, but it's actually uh, okay to, to my understanding. Um, 
that's one point. The second point is that um, this is done in dairy cattle. So um, many things are pretty well set up. So if you use the high density SNP chip and you could get quite a reasonable prediction accuracy by doing nothing else. Um, so the room for improvement is maybe to my understanding, not that much as something, you know, you start from scratch, maybe in a small species like, um, or a traits that are not well studied, you might get, you gain quite a relative uh, increase in accuracy by doing this. So um, I don't have a clear answer on that, but I expect that um, um, the increase in accuracy could generate more than expected value in, for the industry. And also um, it's kind of based on what size and what traits, what size of the population is and what traits you're looking at. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Thank you, Rudang, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, Thanks very much. So, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, so I see that a lot of questions are being typed into the chat box. Uh, so please use the Q&A box to type in your questions, um, which is on the bottom right of your screen. Uh, so uh, okay, it's time to move on to the next presentation, which will be given by Marie-Claire Sanchez from INRE, and the topic is use of custom chips to validate causal variance in cattle. So I remind you again to type in your questions with your name uh, into the Q&A box. So over to you, Marie. Marie so uh, thank you. Uh, so first I thank you, uh, the organizer, for, for giving me uh, the opportunity to present our experience on the use of uh, custom chips to validate uh, causal variance in cattle. And this presentation was uh, prepared with uh, my colleagues, uh, Didier Boichard, Meki Boussa, Aurélien Capitan, and uh, Sébastien Fritz. So uh, the, the Illumina Eurogenomics uh, chip is the custom chip we uh, routinely, routinely used in France and uh, in different countries in Europe. Uh, Eurogenomics is an European consortium of eight countries that was uh, created in uh, 2009 with a threefold uh, objective. First, uh, to enlarge reference populations uh, in Holstein, uh, to conduct uh, common research uh, projects, uh, and to chair uh, design and to purchase large quantities of uh, SNP chips. So uh, a custom chip is designed by Eurogenomics uh, since uh, uh, 2013. It contains SNPs that are used in various breeds for parentage verification, uh, national uh, genomic evaluations, and detection of uh, genetic features. The Eurogenomics chip uh, contains a common part and research parts. The common part uh, contains 50K or HDA SNPs, as well as predictive variants, and the research parts are specific depending on the partner. Mm -hmm. And uh, these research, research parts uh, can be shared uh, between partners. Uh, so the, the chip is uh, physically uh, identical for all partners, but there are uh, specific manifest files that are used to decode the content of each partner. The Eurogenomics chip is uh, frequently updated. And the first uh, chip was a low density uh, based uh, chip uh, with a common part of about uh, 10,000 SNPs and with uh, eight different versions of uh, the research parts with an increasing number uh, of uh, SNPs. And since uh, 2019, uh, the EuroGMD uh, contains a common part of about uh, 50,000 SNPs and the third version is uh, currently uh, in production. So the, the, the chip uh, is uh, updated about once a year by each partner, partner and uh, in, it consists of uh, analysis, uh, the research part of the current version. Uh, SNPs uh, that are validated are moved to the common part and the SNPs that present uh, technical issues that uh, are no polymorphic or non-validated are removed. Then a new set of uh, variants uh, is uh, selected for in silico design and uh, the chip can be manufactured by uh, Illumina. 
then uh, the new version is, uh, it is, is tested in particular for the clustering definition. And after that, uh, the, the chip can be used for uh, genetic selection and uh, research uh, projects. And in total, it takes about uh, five months between the design of a new version and uh, its use uh, for genomic selection or uh, research. The content of the research part differs depending on the partner. And in the French research uh, parts, uh, we have a different type of, uh, of variants. Uh, candidate variants that are detected for uh, genetic defects, candidate embryonic lethal variants, uh, variants that have a strong uh, predicted deleterious annotation, uh, also uh, boundaries of uh, structural variants, SNPs that are predicted to have regulatory function, and uh, finally, uh, candidate causal SNPs from uh, GWASPs. And you can see that uh, depending on, on the variants, uh, we have from a few candidate variants for genetic defects or embryonic losses, for example, uh, to a high number of candidate variants uh, from uh, GWAS peaks of uh, complex spreads. Concerning candidate variants for genetic defects or candidate uh, embryonic lethal variants, uh, custom chips are uh, very useful. Uh, first, to confirm the genotype uh, status concordance or the absence of recessive homozygotes in the case of embryonic lethal variants. Uh, also, to estimate the allelic frequencies in the breed uh, where the candidate uh, SNP was found, but also in a broad range, uh, range of, uh, of our breeds. Uh, to accurately uh, identify animals that carry the mutation, and uh, then uh, to eradicate uh, deleterious mutations that are responsible for the genetic defect or embryonic losses. Uh, we, uh, we identified more than uh, uh, 40 uh, causal variants um, for genetic defects over the last 10 years, thanks to the French National Observatory of Genetic Diseases and the, and the custom chip. And you can see here uh, some examples of uh, genetic defects that, uh, for, for which we identify the causal variants uh, in different breeds. And today I will uh, speak more uh, particular, particularly of one of them, which is Ataxia that was uh, found in, uh, in the Charolais breed. Uh, Ataxia is a neurodegenerative and late onset uh, disease. Uh, young, uh, young adults are affected, so it is a disease uh, which has a very high cost and uh, an impact on the, on the animal welfare. Uh, from world genome sequences of uh, two affected animals, uh, we uh, identified uh, a single recessive SNP uh, in the coding region of uh, the KIF1C gene. Uh, that results in uh, loss of function uh, and that was responsible for ataxia. So this uh, mutation was uh, uh, added to the custom chip and it was possible to estimate the, the frequency of the recessive allele uh, in Chaoré first and we, we found a, a high uh, frequency of uh, this allele, about uh, 13%, while no recessive allele uh, was found in the other breeds. In addition, uh, thanks to the, the custom chip, it was possible to estimate the favorable effect on, uh, of this recessive allele on muscular and skeletal development in heterozygotes. And it uh, probably explained uh, why we have a high frequency in Charolais. And uh, it was also possible to identify carrier animals and to select uh, against this uh, recessive allele. Embryonic lethal variants uh, are detected by a deficit in homozygous animals by comparing the observed versus the ex expected number of homozygotes. And to have uh, at least uh, 20 recessive homozygotes expected, uh, you can see that uh, we need to have uh, 2,000 animals uh, with uh, genotypes for frequency of uh, 10% and uh, at least uh, 200,000 animals with uh, genotypes uh, for frequency of uh, 1%. So embryonic lethal variants are more easily uh, detected in breeds uh, with a large number of uh, genotyped animals. Uh, for example, in the Montbéliard breed, uh, we identified uh, 11 haplotypes with a significant deficit in uh, homozygotes. 
among these haplotypes, uh, we have MH1 and MH2, which, which are the mo most uh, frequent uh, uh, haplotypes, uh, and uh, which have uh, a significant negative effect on Calvin rate. So, uh, whole genome sequences of carriers and non -carrier, uh, carriers bulls were compared, and two missense mutations were identified in uh, two genes. Uh, SHBG for MH1 and SLC37A2 for MH2. Both of them were added to the custom chip, and uh, we obtained uh, genotypes for more than 100,000 uh, animals, and we found uh, 242 homozygotes for the first gene, uh, SHBG, while uh, zero uh, homozygote was found for uh, SLC37A2. Uh, so thanks to the custom chip, it was possible to exclude the candidate variant for SHBG uh, and to confirm the candidate variant for SLC37A2. So new, new investigations were, uh, were conducted to identify a candidate variant for the MH1 haplotype. And the likely a causal research mutation was proposed in the PFAS uh, uh, gene because no homozygotes were uh, found among uh, 25,000 animals, while uh, 122 were expected. And uh, uh, genotypes in, uh, in all breeds uh, revealed that the, the, the MH1 uh, haplotype was uh, specific to, to the Montbéliard uh, breed. So uh, today uh, in Montbéliard, uh, we have an accurate uh, testing uh, for, for breeding animals, and it is possible to, to, uh, to select against this uh, little mutation. Over uh, embryonic little SNPs were identified in the main French dairy breeds, so three in Montbéliard, seven in Holstein, and two in Normande, and others uh, are under study in uh, various groups. Uh, so uh, on, the, um, on the research part of the custom chip, we have also variants that uh, have a strong predicted deleterious annotation uh, that we detect with uh, reverse uh, genetics. In uh, 2016, uh, a list of uh, putative deleterious variants in uh, about uh, 2,000 genes was uh, proposed. Uh, and these variants were uh, segregated at a frequency of uh, at least 5% in at least one breed. And uh, they revealed uh, significant enrichment for genes that are related to a uh, nervous, visual, and auditory system, uh, with uh, about 18% of genes that were related to retina development and function. So uh, one uh, frame, sh frame shift mutation in the RP1 uh, gene was particularly investigated because it was observed uh, in uh, numerous uh, breeds and it uh, segregated at a high frequency in the normal uh, breed. You can see here the, the frequency. Uh, so um, a fine phenotypic characterization uh, of uh, control animals and affected animals uh, revealed uh, a loss of uh, photoreceptor cells that confirmed the retinal degeneration for uh, the affected animals uh, that finally uh, go blind. So what is interesting with uh, reverse uh, genetics, uh, it's, uh, it is that uh, it becomes possible to anticipate the emergence of uh, new genetic defects because uh, recessive defects typically emerge in the fifth generation, uh, corresponding to uh, the first inbred mating between uh, descendants of a uh, common ancestor. And in the study presented here, uh, uh, from whole genome sequences uh, data of uh, 43 bulls from four different breeds that were born uh, one to four generations before the current population, uh, 18 private deleterious mutations were identified. And among uh, these mutations, five were de novo mutations that are expected to cause uh, severe recessive conditions. And one uh, of them is a frame, sh frame shift mutation in uh, the EDAR gene uh, that uh, was found in a Charolais bull and uh, that is known to, to cause uh, dysplasia in uh, humans. 
that is responsible for sparse hair and absence of teeth. And in the, in the offspring of the carrier rule, uh, seven uh, homozygous uh, calves were uh, identified and they were all affected. So it uh, validated the, the causal mutation. Uh, we also find on the custom chip uh, boundaries of uh, structural variants. On chips, uh, we, can, we can test only a single nucleotide uh, change, but uh, for uh, some structural variants, uh, it is possible to test for the nucleotide change at the breakpoints. Uh, for example, here, uh, for an insertion deletion, uh, we can see that uh, uh, we have a, a SNP here uh, with A and G alleles uh, in, uh, in black. And uh, we can see that the A allele is associated with a deletion, while the G allele is associated with an insertion. And it is the same thing on the other side with uh, this other SNP in red and the T and C alleles. So with uh, this uh, strategy, it is possible to design most of the structural variants on the custom chip. And uh, the, the, what we do regularly in the team is to identify structural variants from whole genome sequences. Uh, among these uh, structural uh, variants, we select uh, the ones that modify uh, genes. And these uh, structural variants are added uh, to the custom chip for confirming their effects on different traits. And uh, I give uh, here uh, two, two examples. Uh, one insertion that uh, was responsible for poldness and the deletion responsible for the, the pold and multi uh, systemic syndrome. And in all cases, uh, it allows large scale and accurate uh, genotyping of uh, structural variants. Uh, we also, uh, uh, on the custom uh, uh, chip, we also have uh, SNPs that are predicted to have a regulatory function. Uh, so as mentioned uh, uh, previously by Widong, uh, many mutations affecting complex uh, traits regulate the expression of uh, genes. And the SNPs that uh, alter uh, transcription factor binding uh, sites can be predicted from databases that contain experimental results of other species. So these RSNPs uh, can be added uh, to, to the custom chip and combined with uh, other data, for example, expression data that are available in public databases, they help to prioritize candidate variants in the GWSPs. So um, in this study, we uh, identified 83 QTL for milk mineral composition. And uh, we, sh we showed that uh, in the QTL regions, 184 variants uh, overlapped with uh, transcription factor binding uh, sites. And uh, these variants were identified as, uh, as putative uh, ASNIPs. So the, the, the last categories of uh, variants we find on the custom chip uh, is uh, candidate causal SNPs from uh, GWASPIX. Uh, now we have more and more GWAS results on large populations from uh, genotypes that are imputed at the whole genome sequences. And uh, what we regularly do uh, is to identify uh, the best candidate variants in the GWAS peaks and to add uh, these uh, this variants to the custom chip. Uh, when uh, when we have uh, cows with, uh, we, we, with genotypes for the last version of the chip that contain uh, these uh, candidate variants, it is possible to perform a backward imputation to impute uh, the genotypes of the cows uh, which, uh, which have phenotypes. And we showed that uh, this imputation was uh, accurate. After that, it is, it is possible to, to perform GWAS uh, for testing the effects of the candidate variants and to confirm uh, these uh, effects or not. Uh, in this example for uh, milk protein composition, we have a Manhattan plot uh, with, in red, uh, the candidate variants, and in the green and the black, the 50K uh, SNPs. 
So uh, you can see that uh, candidate variants are almost uh, systematically more significant uh, than uh, the 50K SNP. In this other example, uh, we identified the uh, uh, QTL um, in Montbéliard, Holstein, and Normand de uh, Bulls, sorry. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the QTL regions, we uh, we identified the candidate variants and we uh, add uh, this variant, we added this variant to the custom chip. And uh, then we validated this uh, variant uh, in cows of the same weight. And in this example, uh, you have a QTL on the chromosome six that was identified for uter and uh, um, uter depth and uh, uter health with the candidate variants uh, in green. And in all cases, uh, you can see that the variant with the most significant effects is the same. It is located in an intron of uh, uh, the GC gene, uh, which is a good functional candidate for all these threats. And uh, this variant could be the causal variant, or at least a variant in a strong linkage that's equilibrium with uh, the causal variant. Uh, in addition, uh, various uh, studies show an improvement in the accuracy uh, and in the slope of genomic predictions uh, when uh, candidate variants identified from GWAS are included. So there is a great interest to include these variants on the custom chip that is used uh, for genomic selection. To conclude, um, Despite a few limitations, because it takes uh, between eight to uh, 12 months between uh, the identification of a candidate variant and uh, uh, the obtention of a large number of animals with uh, genotypes for this variant, uh, because also uh, not uh, all variants can be designed, for example, for uh, some duplications or in regions where with a high density of uh, variants. And uh, about 10 to 20 percent of uh, the design, design variants uh, can be uh, lost during manufacturing of the chip or because uh, of uh, local call rate. Um, difficulties uh, can be encountered with uh, the clustering procedure, uh, in particular when one genotype is rare or absent. Uh, so it, it needs a uh, clustering verification at uh, each uh, new chip version. But uh, uh, because the custom chip makes it possible to genotype large populations of uh, various breeds, uh, the custom chip is the, the pillar of our research uh, strategy uh, because of uh, synerg synergetic use for genomic selection and dissection of phenotypes. Because the chip uh, is a uh, cheap and effective tool uh, to, uh, to search for uh, causal variants, it allows an accurate backward imputation of the whole populations with uh, genotypes. Uh, it uh, allows uh, um, fast and straightforward dissemination of results for uh, grading. And uh, finally, it offers uh, many opportunities uh, to confirm and uh, validate uh, results. So uh, I, uh, I thank uh, all my colleagues of the EBS UMT uh, who participated to the studies I uh, presented, uh, presented today. And I also thank all the founders and the partners who contribute uh, to, to uh, the design of the Euro Genomics uh, chip. And uh, thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thanks, Marie-Pierre. Uh, for a very interesting talk. So now um, it's open for discussion. Please type in your questions into the Q&A box. I see no questions at the moment. Um, so maybe I can start with one. Um, you listed quite a few technical difficulties in designing the chip. Um, are you considering um, other approaches, maybe low pass sequencing? Um, do you mean that, uh, I'm not sure to, to understand the, the end of the question, sorry. 
so are you considering any new technology to replace uh, this custom chip, uh, given you have some difficulties in designing the chip? Uh, you can also comment on how many uh, SNPs um, you fail to put on the chip, uh, which you intend to do, but still because of the technical difficulties, have you, um, you had to leave them out? Uh, do you know what fraction of uh, SNPs had to be left out? Uh, um, may I answer, please? Uh, yes. Yes, please. Uh, please. Um, yeah, so, uh, Oh. The same team as my peer. So we want to, to, to move from a chip to, to, to another technology. Uh, of course, that's something that will happen in the future. We don't know exactly when, but presently we are very much set by the chip, which is very convenient. And uh, more, uh, moreover, it is uh, shared uh, over a very large uh, community with a number of labs, a number of evaluation centers, and number of researchers and such a decision to move from uh, one platform to, to another is a very, very uh, strong decision. So it, in any case, it will take uh, some time. In, in addition, the chip is, uh, uh, is used with very large quantities. So uh, uh, the price is quite attractive. So uh, it is probably also a way a uh, reason why we will not move immediately. Uh, when when the uh, marker fails, uh, either it is not too much important and uh, can be replaced by another one in the neighborhood. And uh, usually we put several markers in the same regions. And uh, when a uh, marker is one of the must be marker, uh, the first thing to, we, we do is to repeat it on the, on the chip several times, hope, hoping that at least one of them will work, uh, may work. I don't know if it answers the question. Yes, uh, thanks Didier. Um, so I see another question from Hubert. Uh, so he's asking, what is the benefit of including true causal variants for complex traits rather than tagging variants? Does your genomic prediction models make use of causal variants? Example, do you use feature-based models such as Bayes-R? Uh, we use, uh, currently for genomic uh, uh, evaluation, we use the EuroGMD uh, chip, uh, so which uh, contains uh, uh, causal variants or candidate causal variants for the different uh, traits uh, we study. So these uh, variants are included in the models for uh, genomic evaluation. But uh, we, um, uh, we, for the moment, we use uh, a model that consider uh, equally uh, each, uh, each variant. So uh, no, no model considering different weights for uh, causal variants, for example. But it will be possible in the future. A very important point also is to remember that we always look at the accuracy, which is probably, which is probably not the best criterion for that, because uh, in terms of accuracy at the next generation, uh, the gain is always limited. But you you may gain in the slope, so in absence of bias, in terms of uh, persistency uh, over several generations. And if you want to go further with more complex model, for instance, uh, uh, even dominance for some uh, loci or interaction between genes, you will need the causal variance. Otherwise, uh, an, uh, an uh, epistatic model with uh, uh, only uh, neutral uh, markers is more or less meaningless. So that, my feeling is that the genomic evaluation of the future will be more and more based on, on causal variance. Even if the gain at the first generation within breed and especially in the large breed is limited. 
Yes. Thanks, Mary Pierre and Didier, for this discussion. Um, in the interest of time, we have to move on to the next presentation. So thank you very much, Mary Pierre, again for thank your you. presentation. Uh, the next talk is so next talk is the next next talk is from Jesse Hoff from Gencov. I will talk about routine implementation of sequencing in genomic evaluations using low pass imputation and hybrid capture. So over to you, Jesse. Great, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic, okay, and I will share my screen. So it's a real honor to be here today and I'm happy to report that uh, it's now 7.15 in Los Angeles and I'm, I'm well caffeinated. So uh, we'll be talking about uh, the next phase in genomic evaluation and genotype data generation after a couple of great talks on how to optimize uh, the use of arrays. Um, and before we go on, I, I just want to say that there's been a, a great team at GenCove and Neogen who, who has helped put all of the work into uh, the data that we'll be sharing here. So I just wanted to, to thank them collectively. Uh, we, we've got a lot of exciting work to share. So the talk is going to cover uh, what our background is and what our vision and goal is. Um, and then we're going to overview this technology that we're calling InfiniSeq and then go into some validation data on this technology. So um, as you've seen in the, in the previous presentations, um, you know, we built an incredible system for genomic selection that's based on arrays. It's generated millions of samples a year now, uh, starting from a, a very modest point, a mere 10, 12 years ago. And we really believe that sequencing's moment has arrived. This has been a much discussed question, um, but between the technological advances that we've shown here today, along with continued improvement in sequencing and introduction of new sequencing technologies, uh, we think that, that the time is really here for, for genotyping in livestock to transition to sequencing. And we're, we're putting our marker down now on the year 2022 as the start of the sequencing era. So the team behind this here is uh, GenCove and Neogen. And for those of you who don't know GenCove, we're a venture-backed uh, software company uh, based in New York. And our, our CEO and uh, co-founder, or CTO, uh, are Joe Pickerel and, and Tomas Barisa. And we are really excited to be working with Neogen, who many of you know is the, the world leader in, in DNA testing in animals, to provide uh, sequencing as a solution at scale, where GenCove is providing the software support and Neogen is implementing the assay and together we're, we're ironing out the technology and, and launching it to the community. Uh, what this then delivers is a throughput that is capable of meeting the needs of genomic evaluations. So we've been able to demonstrate the ability to do thousands of samples a day and are expanding that. Um, and the delivery of a result which far exceeds the complexity and density of any commercial solution that's out there today. And of course, at, at an affordable price point that enables its routine application in, in sequencing. This of course also comes along with GenCove software, which makes processing, managing and, and accessing this data um, a tangible, tangible matter for the community because you know, with all this extra data, there certainly is a need to deftly manage the additional data load. So the technology that we are focused on um, in delivering here is something we're calling InfiniSeq. And InfiniSeq uh, is focused on addressing a few of the, the, the questions uh, that have come up already in this presentation today about how do we get really high density data, an affordable price point um, in a scalable way 
continue to add and update uh, new information to our assays and our evaluations all the time. And the approach that we're now taking involves um, a combination of low-pass sequencing, which you may have heard of us talk about before, along with targeted high-coverage data. This comes both in one molecular reaction as well as one uh, data deliverable. And by doing this, we get fundamentally highly accurate genome-wide information uh, and a process that ultimately will look quite similar to an end user, but also from the, you know, some of the efforts that we've talked about today of design and implementation, one that's even easier, more flexible, quite reliable, and one that can scale to the, to the needs of the industry. So what does that look like? Uh, again, it's, it's still a sequencing reaction on a next, a short read next generation sequencing instrument that takes place in a, a single um, single molecular workflow. And then the output of that is a combination of this low pass sequencing, which we use to power imputation, along with high coverage at targeted regions of interest that allow for highly accurate genotyping of specific loci. That data is generated at Neogen's labs and then moved on to the GenCove platform for imputation and uh, variant calling in the targeted regions of interest. So what this then combines is all the things that we've come to love about low-pass sequencing. It's extremely flexible. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, we have some, some papers and literature out on it, but essentially um, we take short read, low coverage data, less than one X in, in coverage. And we use that to identify known haplotypes in our population. So the deliverable out of that from this process uh, for cattle with Neogen will be 2.2 million SNPs uh, that include a <clears throat> enormous complement of the kind of functional variant, functional variants that uh, were being discussed earlier. Uh, along with all of the legacy arrays that Neogen has been offering in the cattle market. So you really get the full complement of, of both the, the past and the future. And it's driven by a reference panel of known haplotypes that includes all of the important global breeds and is expanding to include more breeds and more training data all the time. We then add into that uh, high coverage sequencing, which gives us direct observation of both known and unknown variation. Um, this is the clinical gold standard for genotype data uh, at this point, uh, meaning high coverage short read sequence data analyzed with a variant caller is more accurate than Sanger sequencing, PCR uh, arrays, and provides tremendous flexibility for um, additional analysis, for updating the target set, um, and, and frankly, for doing other things with the data with, with a, a uh, still a, a package that's simple to implement and affordable. So I wanna talk briefly about how we've implemented low-pass sequencing in a novel system um, and in a novel set of populations with the folks at CTLGH. And then I'll get more into um, some detail on validation on the work that we've done around hybrid capture. So uh, this is a project that we did with the Center for Tropical Livestock uh, at the Roslyn Institute. And the goal was to design an assay that could capture the diversity of African chicken populations. And our approach was to create one of our custom haplotype reference panels from a large amount of high coverage sequence data that had been generated by the team there. And the great thing about the chicken is that its genome is smaller. So it's, it's quite easy to get a, a large training data set, even if you don't have sort of the thousand bulls type data set ready to go. 
uh, we then sought to validate the use of this data set as a training data set for low pass imputation through a leave one out imputation model and confirm that we have a, a, a resource that can provide very accurate genotyping for samples from these populations. So we had about 583 samples in our training data. And like I said, there's uh, really good coverage of that population. Um, so lots of 50X genomes, though I, I will say, as you'll see in, in what we talk about in cattle and work that we've done in other species, um, we can work with much lower coverage data as part of our training model, so four to 10X. And really the key goal here is to make sure that we capture as many of the common haplotypes in the population as possible. So this panel resulted in a data set with about 30 million variants, including almost 6 million indels and 23 million SNPs. And here's a PCA plot showing uh, the, the types of samples that were included, uh, including, as you can see here, sort of this outgroup of light Sussex samples, and then the really broad span of diversity of the African chicken populations. And we see here in our leave one out approach, the typically high accuracy that we see when we take one of these high coverage samples, downsample it to half X, impute it with the reference panel and compare the genotypes from the high coverage data to the low coverage imputation. So low coverage sequencing works quite well. It particularly works quite well in these kinds of um, small genomes. And this process took us a couple months and we were able to get a super high density assay that can be affordably sequenced um, and we've since gone on to use for, for some great projects with them and in, in study populations from, from uh, these programs. So moving on to, to cattle and the work that we've been doing in, in Finiseek, uh, we have a cattle reference panel and we've made these now for many different species. Our cattle panel is uh, our biggest um, in livestock. And we launched a new one sometime last year. Um, it now includes over 50 breeds and 1,800 animals. It's most of the public component of the Thousand Bulls program, along with some proprietary material. And it in allows us to genotype almost all the variants that are used in commercial genomic evaluations globally, and all of the important breed groups that are uh, that are using genomic selection today. We have validated this panel before and our technology in cattle many times. Um, one recent example of this is a publication we did with the USDA Meat Animal Research Center and Warren Snelling and the team there. Uh, we worked with them to genotype samples both on the F250 array and with low pass sequencing. And we compared genotyping between that array and there were other array data on these samples as well. Um, and their, their genotypes from low pass sequencing. And again, we see where we have good representation of these breed groups in our reference panel, we get very accurate genotyping genome wide of, of the SNPs in our reference panel. <clears throat> However, as we know, there's a good deal of loci that are commonly used in breeding programs that have been um, discussed heavily in the previous presentation that uh, require more than 99% certainty um, and that for various reasons, imputation is, is a challenge for. And so um, we decided to implement an approach that we've been using for a while on the human genomic side, um, which involves uh, a technology quite similar to exome sequencing, known as hybridization, where we design probes for regions of the genome and then can essentially pull down those regions to get high coverage sequencing at desired loci. And the way this process looks for us 
um, because, you know, as you know, this, this technology, unlike, unlike other targeted sequencing technologies, is, is quite flexible. It can, it can go all the way up to a full exome of, uh, of target data. Um, but in our case, uh, in conjunction with Neogen, we were targeting about 800 locations. And um, we, uh, we were able to um, succeed in capturing over 99% of our design targets in our design and validation process, uh, which I think, you know, if you compare to the experience that the community has had in, in designing those, those array probes, um, it's quite good. And, and I, I would add that these are some of the key diagnostic regions um, in the breeds and populations that we work with. And so these are quite enriched for, for the complex regions of the genome. And this technology was able to generate high coverage data on those targets quite readily. So this covers proprietary diagnostics along with parentage markers. Um, and we've now validated this in hundreds of samples that are known carriers of uh, these key alleles uh, that we have existing chip, chip genotypes on so that we can confirm the um, comparability of the data from, from low pass, uh, or sorry, of, of capture with, with arrays. So just looking at um, just looking at the first few hundred samples that we've genotyped with this process, we were able to demonstrate for a number of samples, or sorry, a number of alleles. Um, we haven't completed this uh, evaluation yet, but uh, we were able to evaluate this and, and show that we had uh, nearly perfect concordance between the genotypes that we call with the chip and those that we call with the uh, capture data, the high coverage capture data. And those include things like the pulled locus, MC1R, A2, Calpane. Um, we have more comprehensive validation of this that, that we'll be able to share soon uh, using the full complement of all of the, the targets that we looked at. But uh, this analysis does take a little bit of time to set up and, and we're still working through it. So this is this is a, a process that we're, we're going through right now and um, we'll be launching commercially soon. Very excited about that. And to give you a better idea of what this data looks like in more detail, again, we have this, these are IGV plots um, of the data that we generate. And you see that um, we still get this low coverage data uh, genome wide which again, on average is about half X in coverage, though it can vary depending on the species and, and the, the population that we're targeting. Um, and then we have these regions of interest where we have hybridization probes and a substantial pileup of coverage that allows us to directly observe and call heterozygous loci or uh, alternative alleles. And uh, yeah, that's you know really again the gold standard for, for doing this. This is a representation of, of real data that we have, but it, it's not quite to scale. Um, we also can see you know beyond just looking at simple SNPs, we can directly observe things like the pulled Celtic allele, which you know our data with our reference genome looks like a 16 base pair indel, and. Uh, this allows us, again, to, to make that direct observation of that variant and really see what's going on and not, not rely on um, hybridization or uh, probe clusters on an array um, and really can be a self-contained analysis of a single individual. <clears throat> so in total, what we see from InfiniSeq is that this really allows us to make a transition forward with low pass sequencing, uh, with sequencing overall as the solution for routine genomic evaluation. And we'll be able to go after the kinds of goals identified earlier in today's presentations 
on making improvements to genomic prediction, on adding in new populations very easily, on uh, rapidly updating the complex and important variation that we identify at, at, at uh, very high accuracy um, and, and continue to improve our, our breeding programs forward in the, in the future. So thanks very much for your, uh, your, your attention today and uh, for inviting us on this presentation. I, I, I once again wanna thank our colleagues at Neogen and, and the data and lab teams at, at GenCove and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jesse. Um, now it's open for discussion. Um, so please type in your questions into the question and answer box and not to the chat box. Uh, we have one question at the moment from Arnav Mehrotra from ETH Zurich. He says, hi, Jesse, uh, do you have suitable reference panels for BOSS Indicus cattle? If so, how is genotype concordance in indesign breeds when compared to arrays? So that's a great question. Um, I would say that currently our representation of BOSS Indicus samples is not as comprehensive as taurine samples. Um, we have seen that uh, we have been able to get to higher genotyping accuracy by incorporating um, additional samples from those populations. So we, we do have hundreds of BOSS indica samples in total available in our data set between different Brahmin, Lore, and other um, indocene breeds. Um, but we do also know that, that the overall genetic diversity amongst those populations is, is quite high. Um, so to, to really adapt the solution for low pass to those kinds of populations, um, it's, it's important to, to validate performance um, and, and where necessary, add in more um, data to the reference panel. However, I, I think we would say, you know, we, we really believe as we've seen sort of comparable case in the CTLGH example, um, the, the, the arrays that have been designed with very limited information for these kinds of populations um, or with information that's biased towards uh, European um, breed types um, doesn't really capture the full diversity. So even a imperfect solution based on low pass sequencing um, for those populations is going to provide a much better opportunity to capture the important uh, diversity and make genomic evaluations in these kinds of samples um, and gives you far more density to, to capture uh, uh, regions of the genome that are not tagged by um, the European arrays. Uh, and, and furthermore, I, I guess I would add in that, um, you know, there's probably ultimately a need to switch to a reference genome that is specific to indocene. And the data that we generate with low pass in the future can be translated to that kind of genome. Um, and we can rebuild the, the full pipeline in, in that kind of context um, and provide a, a much better solution for, for capturing that data. Uh, translation of the array data to that kind of novel indicene reference genome not only would that be quite complicated, as many of you know, but but also fundamentally the data that has been designed and the probe designs are are driven on the wrong reference genome, essentially. So the low pass data that we generate, again, is not affected by the fact that we don't know exactly what the indice genome is supposed to look like. So great question. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, the next question is from Niv Palti. Uh, the question is, what genome resources will be needed to use this platform in other minor species like aquaculture, um, fish species? Great, great question. So again, the great thing about low pass, you know, it really depends on the application. Um, if the goal is to just get started in a new species with straightforward things like GBLUP and uh, variety population tagging, um, uh, pedigree identification and management, uh, then we really don't need a, a ton of data to get started, right? So the construction of a reference panel, like you saw with CTLGH, um, now it can involve a few hundred samples, but we've succeeded in designing reference panels with just a few dozen samples. 
Um, and that means that you can really get off and running with the ability to generate high density genotypes at high throughput um, without having hundreds of high coverage sequences. Um, and of course, you know, if you find that, say, you're working in an aquaculture species and the first panel that we design doesn't capture uh, all of the types of, say, tilapia that, that you're going to be using in your breeding program or sturgeon, um, then we can always update the reference panel quite readily um, by sequencing more samples that match those populations. Okay, the next question is from Matthew McClure. Um, is there a limit on the number of targeted probes in the array to get parentage causative arrays? Um, yeah. uh, so maybe if I can ask it for a clarification, is the question, is there a limit on the number of, of targets that we can include in this, in this sequencing panel from a molecular perspective? Is that the question, Matt? Maybe if you can answer in the chat. I, and I guess to, to answer that question, and feel free to clarify if that's not the question. Um, the answer is fundamentally, there, there's not a substantial limit on, on how many targets that we can go after to, as you say, make sure that we capture parentage and, and all the new kinds of variation um, that are being identified that we might want to incorporate into this um, assay, uh, certainly at the extreme, we have done assays that are exomes plus low pass um, on the human side. Uh, and uh, unlike other amplicon sequencing technologies, um, there's no sort of immediate pressure in the scope and size of what we're doing right now, um, both in terms of the cost of the reagents uh, or, or in terms of um, the ability to successfully capture them all efficiently. So we're, we're quite confident that, that we'll be able to expand this readily um, uh, for, for the, the long term. Um, so uh, if you can see the um, question and answer box, uh, Matthew McClure, um, yeah. about this question, he says, basically, can we put yes. 100,000? Yes, that's... Yeah. that's 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 exactly right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So the next question is from Herman Schwarzenbacher um, okay. from Zook Data, and the question is: How are the per unit costs of Infinisig technology in relation to SNP chip arrays for 50k or HD data? Well, that's a great question, and I believe that a few of our colleagues from Neogen are on today, such as Gary Evans, and uh, I would suggest reaching out to them to to find out more. So, uh, but I, I, I can comment uh, at a high level that the goal of this is to be a technology that, that, it, that is suitable for routine genomic evaluation. So uh, in the right context, the pricing can be quite attractive. Okay, I think we have time for one last question, uh, which is from Tim Knudsen. Can you make use of multiple reference genomes to capture more of the structural variation, like what is available for cattle and human? That's a great question. Um, and certainly in principle, as, as I mentioned in discussing the indicine cattle, um, whether it's analyzing one of these high coverage targets or looking at the low pass data overall, uh, the availability of well-resolved reference genomes for complex regions or genome-wide is, is certainly possible for us. We have not directly implemented the use of, for example, a pan genome, um, but we have seen in cases, for example, in, in plant breeding, this is quite common that, that folks will have multiple assemblies and we can rebuild the entire reference training data set on different assemblies um, and better resolve uh, germplasm that is um, better represented by, by the appropriate varietal uh, reference genome. So for example, any of the data that we generate today in Holstein cattle, if we were to translate this over to a Holstein specific reference genome, there, there would be content that, that would be available that's, that's just not on the arrays today. 
Yeah, I think that you can take this question. Uh, it's quite, um, can answer it quickly. I think how big was the size of the reference panel in chicken population? Uh, it was about 500 samples. Okay. okay um, Thank, thanks for all the questions, that, everyone. Yeah. So thanks, Jesse, for, for an interesting presentation. And uh, we'll have to move to the next uh, presentation. So thanks again. Uh, the next talk is from Anik Bowman from Wageningen, Wageningen University. So um, Anik, you can start with your presentation. Thank you. Um, so I'll uh, talk about opportunities using uh, structural variation in animal improvement um, programs. Um, this is work that we've done in the Breed for Food uh, program uh, over the last four years. Um, first of all, what is a structural variation? Um, there are two types that we consider that's unbalanced, uh, which are copy number variants. So these are duplications, deletions, insertions, um, but they're also balanced um, structural variants like inversions and translocations, where um, the copy number is still two, but they're on a, in the other switch or in a diff different location in the genome. Um, so the size um, that we consider is, is uh, 50 base pairs or larger. And with that or larger, it can even go up to a whole chromosome like trisomy or monosomy. Um, they are uh, relevant because um, they cover a higher percentage, percentage of the genome um, than our uh, SNPs that we usually look at. Um, and they're also more likely to affect the gene. Um, to affect the functional region, such as a gene. Um, so there are different DNA technologies that can actually detect um, and these uh, structural variants. Um, Old-fashioned uh, cytogenetics uh, by staining the chromosomes or putting fluorescence markers on them, uh, you can find balanced and unbalanced forms of um, larger size. Um, you can also use intensity data from SNP arrays, um, and there you can only find the unbalanced forms, so the copy number variants. Um, and of course, you can use uh, sequence data, and then you can find both balanced and unbalanced forms. And you can go even smaller in size. Um, so that's the nice part of uh, sequencing. You can actually really look at the breakpoints and define them. Um, refine them to the exact locations. Um, in my talk today, I will cover three different types of structural variation. Um, first of all, copy number variants. Um, uh, so deletions and duplications. Um, a, a PhD student of mine worked on that in cattle. Um, next, I will go into balanced reciprocal translocation uh, where um, part of two different chromosomes are exchanged. And this is seen uh, most often in pigs. And then finally, I will look at the uh, aneuploidy where a full chromosome is, is lost or gained um, like in human um, uh, in uh, Down syndrome cases where they have three copies of chromosome 21. So first of all, the regular copy number variants that most of us are more familiar with. Um, so we looked at deletions or duplication um, they are quite common in our genomes and they're segregating in populations. So together with the University of, of Liège, um, we, um, we had a, a nice reference population that was sequenced um, with high coverage uh, where we could uh, define the, the CMVs uh, with bioinformatic tools. And one that stood out was located um, in a well-known QTL region on chromosome six in the cattle. Um, I think Marie-Pierre also mentioned it. Um, so this is a, a, a GWAS uh, for clinical mastitis and the lead SNP in green, you can see here, uh, was a SNP in this duplication. And um, as you can see here, it was a, a duplication in, the, in this GC gene which is an important gene because it encodes the vitamin D binding protein, which is related, vitamin D is related to our immune system. Um, so as you can see in, in this figure A, um, these animals were, this is the coverage and they were sequenced at 30X 
and you can see uh, a large duplication with a lot uh, more coverage. Um, this was actually a hundred case with 120 X coverage. Um, so this, uh, this region was actually duplicated uh, four times in a haplotype. Um, so that made it a quite complex copy number variant. Um, and it was covering uh, the 14th exome of this, uh, of this gene. So we found haplotypes with uh, four copies, five copies and six copies. So four copies was most common uh, versus animals with only one copy. And uh, we also looked at uh, gene expression data. And there we saw that the gene was uh, more expressed in animals with multi multiple copies. So, um, so this showed that the CMV has impact and it's a, uh, on, on such an important trait. Um, in this case, um, we used a, a large reference population to identify and genotype this CMV, uh, but also many other uh, CMVs. Um, this is a quite difficult process. It's all bioinformatics. Um, the data is not always supporting uh, CMVs or it's not always so clear um, as this example. Um, so you find many false positives, also false negatives, um, but you also find a lot of CMV. So uh, Lim found initially more than 13,000 uh, CMV in this data set. And then she tried to genotype each of them quite uh, accurately. And the ones that she could do accurately, um, that was about 4,000 CMVs. And then of those, uh, we picked a number of them um, for which we designed uh, probes to target the breakpoint sequences of those CMVs. Um, just like Marie, uh, Marie Pierre just explained, you can put those on, uh, on the custom part of the chip. Uh, and we did so, and we did that for the Eurogenomics chip um, to genotype also a larger cohort uh, with the SNP array. And um, so far, I think there's now a thousand of animals uh, genotyped with that. And uh, we have looked at the LD between the SNPs, the common SNPs on the, on the 50K and the actual CMV from the sequence data. Um, because they are, they're often a um, different frequency than the SNPs around it. So the LD is not so high. Um, and in the future, we hope to, uh, to test associations uh, with the CMV, with, with all the phenotypes that the, the, the bulls have, and then include that also in, uh, include the CMV SNPs um, in genomic prediction weigh them differently and see if they explain um, a part of the variation and maybe uh, increase the accuracy of genomic prediction. So I think this is a, an opportunity in breeding. Um, there are reference populations available currently in most species in livestock. Um, so a CMV calling and the sequence data can be done. It's not easy, uh, but I think it's worthwhile to uh, to do that. Um, and then, yeah, you can design probes to put them on the chip to study them in, in, in larger populations. So now I continue with the reciprocal translocations. Um, so if you have a, a carrier um, who has exchange between two non-homologous chromosomes, um, it's balanced, there's no DNA gain or loss. It still has all the DNA it should have. It's just in the wrong place. So these animals uh, generally look healthy and have no issues, except when they start reproducing because their gametes, um, half of the gametes are unbalanced. You can have a normal gamete, you can have uh, another balanced reciprocal uh, gamete. Um, but you can also have unbalanced gametes and then you get offspring um, that have a partial trisomy and partial monosomy uh, for those two chromosomes. And these are usually not viable or severely malformed when they are born. 
So in pigs, this is observed uh, relatively frequent, not a lot, but um, they designed um, karyotype screening for that in, in most Western countries. Um, the breeding companies screen their AI boars uh, for this um, because the AI boars are used a lot. So if this spreads in the population, you can get issues quite fastly and economical losses due to the reduced uh, litter sizes. So a half percent of the, uh, the screen boars uh, actually uh, show an abnormal karyotype and most of them are reciprocal translocations. So um, the average reduction in litter size is, uh, is about 40%, but it, it varies quite a lot. So it, it ranges from 10 to 100%. So here's a karyotype of a case that we studied. Um, part of chromosome four has moved to chromosome two and a small part of chromosome two is now uh, attached to chromosome four. So we sequenced this individual and um, we screened it for the breakpoints. And because it's a reciprocal translocation, you need to see it on both the chromosomes um, that it is involved in. Um, but also they have a normal copy of the chromosome. So this is an IGV screenshot on the left um, is chromosome two, uh, on the right is chromosome four. So the reads are aligned to the reference genome and the gray reads are normal reads uh, from the normal copy. And then the colored reads, the yellow ones, they are made pair matched to, mapped to another chromosome, so to chromosome four for the yellow ones and the red ones uh, on the other side, they map to chromosome two. So you see that it's really reciprocal. And then the multicolored reads, these are split reads that actually nicely um, locate the, sorry, the breakpoint um, of the translocation to the base pair position. Um, you can also see in the blue bar up here that, um, um, that there's a gene. And actually, in most of the cases, we found that a gene was disrupted. Still, the animals appear to be healthy. Um, so that shows that even though a gene is disrupted, it's still in a heterozygous state. Um, and probably the normal copy uh, makes sure that the animal functions well. Um, this is also observed in humans quite often that uh, the translocation break up a gene. The nice thing of the sequence reads is that you can really refine the break point. So you can really see where the exact break is. Um, so when you look at the sequence, you can see whether there was some homology on either side, uh, which uh, made the junction a bit smoother or whether they were bluntly attached to each other. And you can also reconstruct how they were att attached to each other and how long the new chromosome now is. So we uh, did a study. We had seven cases with a reciprocal translocation and we had 15 controls that were negative for the, uh, for the karyotyping. And uh, with a blinded study, we found six out of our seven cases back. Um, the seventh one uh, we found after um, knowing the position and it was located in a repetitive area and those are always difficult um, when it comes to short read sequencing. Long reads would help uh, a lot, but uh, with, long, with short reads we couldn't find this one now. Um, yeah, so all the controls, they came out negative. Uh, which is good. And um, we also, the animals were sequenced with 30X coverage and we downsampled that. And uh, in steps of 5X, and uh, that showed us that you need at least 20X coverage to find these um, reciprocal translocation properly in all the six uh, samples that we found with 30X. So you do need a lot of coverage to, to find these. 
Um, so although uh, in sequenced animals, we can screen them for this reciprocal translocation, which is a, a nice novel addition to application of next generation sequencing data. Um, I believe it's currently too costly to apply to all AI bores that companies use. Um, so it may be an opportunity in the future if sequencing costs um, drop further. Um, but for now, it's a, it's a cool novel addition, um, but it's too costly to apply routinely. Then the next uh, part will be on aneuploidy. So that's the loss or gain of a whole chromosome, um, like monosomy, trisomy, um, and also um, haploid or triploid, where the whole genome, uh, either they have only one copy of a genome or, or three copies. Um, so these are really large and they are unbalanced. Um, so they are detectable with all three the methods, old fashioned cytogenetics, with SNP arrays and with sequence data. Um, however, the, the incidence is, is low, um, but it is occurring in also in our breeding populations. So uh, Donna Barry found uh, a number of animals uh, which had only one X chromosome. Um, so one in, in 100,000 cattle and two in 10,000 sheep. Um, which is, is rather limited. Um, but then in, in chicken, they found triploids, uh, about one in 2000. So that's already a bit more frequent. And uh, what's most standing out is the cattle embryos because there they found 14% of uh, the embryos uh, showed, um, showed this aneuploidy. Um, So there it's really worthwhile and it's a really nice opportunity, I think, to, uh, to look for this. So what is happening in the cattle embryos is that um, we see this a lot, this, this whole chromosomes lost or gained, we see this a lot in IVF embryos, uh, not a lot in in vivo embryos, or at least a lot less. You can see here in the bar, the black and the gray are IVF embryos and the white one are flushed embryos. And the incidence is a lot lower in the flushed embryos. And this also results in a difference in, in, in pregnancy rates um, where in vivo, they have 64% uh, pregnancy uh, success rate and in vitro, they have only 40% pregnancy success rate. So I think this is a really nice opportunity um, for embryo pre-selection because in breeding programs currently, uh, most embryos are uh, genotyped. So a biopsy biop is taken and the, those are genotyped uh, to do genomic prediction. So they get a genomic breeding value. And based on that, they select the, the embryos that will be placed in the recipients. And uh, we, we believe that you could also add this aneuploidy screening. Um, so they're genotyped with SNP chips uh, in which you can use the intensity data to also find these abnormalities. And if you then know that an embryo is carrying those, um, you could decide not to place it in a recipient. And um, well, according to a recent study of Silvestri, that could increase the pregnancy rates with seven and a half percent. So what we have done is that we have um, curated a, a unique multi-species data set with a lot of cases um, of monosomy and trisomy um, to develop a routine screening tool um, using deep learning uh, so that you can quickly um, and routinely uh, screen a large uh, amount of animals um, based on their uh, genotype intensity data. So here are three plots. Um, this, the algorithm is based on, on these plots. The first one is a normal animal uh, with um, the, the homozygous AA cluster, a heterozygous cluster and a BB cluster. Then you have a monosomy case with only an AA a 
cluster and a B cluster. And then you have tri uh, trisomy cases, which have two heterozygous clusters. And we could predict these um, based on these images. Um, we trained the model and then we had an independent, uh, independent uh, test set uh, with uh, all three classes. And we could predict them quite well. Uh, the trisomy cases are a bit more difficult um, to predict correctly, but uh, the disomy and uh, so these are just normal animals, uh, but the, and the monosomies, they were uh, perfectly predicted. And this screening tool um, can be applied to, to any diploid species um, that you're studying. Um, and it's quite difficult to make such a program because there's not a lot of data um, because the incidence is so low, there's not a lot of data around. So we had to collect data from multiple species, which was also very nice to do. Um, and this work has been uh, submitted for publication. So um, to summarize um, the opportunities of structural variation in breeding, um, I think that um, next generation sequencing is very useful um, to detect all kinds of structural variation. Uh, in most pieces, we currently have nice reference populations that are well sequenced um, so that you can actually find these. Um, and then, yeah, SNP arrays uh, can be a cost effective way to screen the whole populations for these, um, at least for the unbalanced versions, um, to see um, how relevant they are for the current populations and whether we should be including them in, the, in our genomic prediction models. And then in addition, um, the SNP array data also has this intensity uh, data uh, so that you can screen um, embryos for this anoploidy um, to maybe improve the, the pregnancy rates of embryos. So um, I'd like to thank the Brief Food Partners and the University of Liège for their collaboration and funding. And um, I hope to see you all at the World Congress in Rotterdam later this year. Thanks, Anik. Um, so now this talk is open for discussion. So there's already a question in the question and answer box. So the question is from Maya Hempord. The question is, are the reciprocal translocations mentioned uh, in pig mainly segregating in the population, um, meaning they are known or mainly de novo? So usually they are de novo, um, but they can be if, if, because usually uh, the animals are captured because they have a reduced fertility and then uh, they're either not used in breeding anymore or they test it. Uh, if they are boars, then they usually test it uh, for the carrier type if they really have a reduced litter sizes. Um, if they're not captured, it's, it starts to segregate in the population as well. We saw a few families where it was segregating, um, but they're not, uh, they're not common and they're not, um, yeah, so they occur de novo uh, within a family, basically. Yeah, um, so there are no more questions. So uh, meanwhile, I can ask a question. So you, um, you showed that there's quite a high incidence of aneuploidy in embryos in IVF. Have you looked at the uh, genetics of heritability of this trait are, is it um, genetically predisposed? Some animals are disposed genetically. I don't think anyone has looked at that. And I doubt it's, it's heritable. I think it's, it, it, it has more to do with um, um, the in vitro part that you mature um, the egg cells and, and you do the fertilization in the lab. So it's more an outside uh, cause than an internal one. But I don't think anyone has looked at it. 
Okay, and one more question about the incidence of this um, uh, reciprocal translocations. Um, you said it's quite frequent in pigs. Do you know its incidence in cattle? In cattle, one is known, and it's actually a Robertsonian translocation, and I think it's chromosome 29 attached to chromosome 1, but don't pin me on it. And that's the only one I think that's known. Uh, yeah. So, so, so is there any reason why it is uh, so frequent in pigs? I don't know. In human, it's also more frequent. Uh, but in cattle, yeah, you hardly see it. Okay, then um, we can end this talk. Um, okay. Yeah, we can end this talk uh, now. So thanks again, Anik, for, for an interesting talk. Um, uh, with that, we come to the end of the first part of uh, today's program. Now we move on to the panel discussion, which will be hosted by Hubert Posh. So uh, before I do that, I would like to thank all the uh, participants and uh, also EAP for organizing this webinar. So over to you, Hubert.